Alright, so we're looking at lesson 16 today. We're going to look at simple machines and efficiency. So hopefully after this lesson you'll understand what some simple machines are and you'll understand efficiency. So a simple machine is a mechanical device that can be used for changing the magnitude or the direction of a force or for changing both. You've probably used some simple machines in your life. The two most basic types are the lever and the incline plank. Um, if you've ever moved something, you may have learned that it's easier to push it up a slope than to try and just pick it up completely by yourself. So the wheel and the axis uh, and axle and then the pulley are forms of the lever. So this is your wheel and axle and then this is a set of pulleys. Those are levers. And then the wedge and the screw use the principle of the incline plane. If you've ever looked at the end of a screw, it is a very sharp point and then it gets bigger. And it's so that it can make it easier for you to screw something in. Because you start with a really, really small tip and then it slowly gets bigger. So your machines can reduce the force that are required to perform a task, but it doesn't reduce the work that's required. It just makes it a little bit easier because you don't have to um, you don't have to have as much force to be able to do whatever you're trying to do. If the force required is reduced, then that means that the distance through, through which the force acts must be increased if the work is going to be the same. Because remember, force uh, work equals the force times your distance. So if your force is lower, then your distance is going to have to increase. The mechanical advantage of a simple machine is just the ratio of the output force to the input force. So whatever force is out over whatever force is in. Remember, like I just said, Mechanical work is force times the distance. So machines just let us do the same amount of work by using a lesser force. So if you use a pulley or a lever, you're just going to be having less force to produce the outcome that you want. So far we have used joules for a unit of work. In our everyday lives, we measure force in pounds and distance in feet. So for us people in America, our unit of work is a foot pound. And sometimes they will use that unit of work in problems throughout the book, but that's the same thing as a joule. If you have a pulley that has no friction, then the tension in your rope is not going to change as the rope passes over the pulley. And that is an ideal concept. Um, it's not perfect, but it it's what we use in physics so that we can get a concept of it. And if you go on to work with physics in real life, then you'll learn how to deal with that in real life. So if you look at the first picture, she's just going over the one pulley. And so this tension is the same as the tension over here, and so it's 100 pounds, so she's still pulling up 100 pounds. So that didn't really lower any work that she would have to do, or any force that she would have to apply. However, if you look here, the 100 is pulling down, and we have a tension that's going up here and that's going up here, and the 100 pounds is pulling down. Whereas on this one, the 100 pounds is pulling down and she was pulling down, so those had to balance out. Over here, the 100 gets split between the left side and the right side, so they each become 50. So that helps make it so her work is tasked as much as it needs to be. On this one, the 100 is pulling down, and then we have this tension here, this tension here, but those, um, those get split in half, so that's why this one's 50 and this one's 50. But over here, this 50 and this 50, it doesn't, well, actually I colored the wrong one. This 50 and this 50 are both pulling down. So 
this pulley up here doesn't change anything. So that's how that works. Now, on this middle figure, she's going to pull with a force of 50. And so that means that she has to move it two feet to make the 100 pounds. Over here, she only has to move it one foot because she's already pulling it at 100 pounds times one gives you the 100 pounds. So this one, she only had to pull for one foot, but on this one, she'd have to pull for two feet. And same thing here, she'd have to pull for two feet. But she has to pull longer, but she doesn't have to put as much force into it. Okay, so let's look at an example. It is often possible to place a weight so that the weight does the work. So we want to put a weight here so that this 1,000 will get pulled up. So we want to know what is the least value that the weight can be so it will pull a 1,000 Newton blocks. And what is the mechanical advantage of the system? How far will the weight have to descend to raise the, the block? Two meters, and if it descends this far in four seconds, how much work will it do, and what is the average power consumption? So that's a lot that we have to do in this one problem. So let's start with part A. We're just going to work part by part. What should be the least value of the weight so that it will descend and raise the 1,000 Newton block? So T1 is pulling down, and it's going to equal 1,000 Newton because that's um, the force, that, the only force that's acting on it. T2 is pulling up on either side. So each of them is going to get split in half. And so it's going to be 500 for T2. For T3, it is pulling up on both of these. And so it gets split in half of this 500. So T3 is 250. And then this is still T3. So it is 250. So what weight will need to be for W? W would need to be 250 Newton to make it begin to move. So if it was more than 250, it would move but that's the least value that it needs to be. Okay, for part B, it asks, what is the mechanical advantage to the system? So for our mechanical advantage, I'm going to do MA. That is the force out divided by the force in. So our output force was 1,000. And our force that we actually had to apply, our force in, was 250. So 1,000 divided by 250 is 4. And we have two sig figs in this problem, so we're going to do 4.0. So that would be your mechanical advantage. For part C, how far will the weight have to descend to raise the 1? thousand Newton weight two meters. So work equals force times distance. So the work that we're trying to do is to raise the 1,000 block. The force that we applied was 250. And so, hold on, let me go back. Um, you don't have to do that formula. You can just do, we were making it change by 2 meters. Our mechanical advantage was 4, and so you just multiply them together to get 8 meters. You don't have to go through and use your weight, uh, work equals force times distance. We had a 4 mechanical advantage, so multiply your distance by that mechanical advantage. Okay, so for part D, It says, 
how much work will it do and what is the average power consumption? So the work that it is going to do is force times the distance. So you can either do 1,000 times 2, which is 2,000, or you can do 250 times 8, which is still 2,000. And so you put bar over the first zero because you have two sig figs, and your units are joules. So that's how much work it does. Work is force times distance. So you can do either one that they gave you. And then average power, we talked about that formula a few lessons ago. It's your work divided by the change in time. So the work we just found was 2,000. And the change in time it gave us was 4 seconds. If you divide those, you get 500. And you put a bar over the first zero because you have two six bits. So that would be your answer for that example. Okay. So with the tension problems, you definitely want to pay attention and label um, your ropes so that you know which ones are the same and which ones are different. Now we're going to look at efficiency. Every real machine wastes energy in some form. So the output work is never equal to the input work. Um, it may be in the form of steam, or maybe in the form of heat, or friction, but somehow your machine is going to waste energy. It's not going to be 100% efficient. The fractional efficiency of any machine is just the ratio of the work out to the work in. So that gives you this formula, work out over work in. So if you multiply it by 100%, that gives you your percent efficiency. So let's look here. We have three machines that are connected in a row. The efficiency of the first machine is 91.5%, the second one is 82%, and the efficiency of the third is 98.5%. What is the overall percent efficiency of the three machines? So we're going to start with something and it's going to go into the first machine and then into the second machine and then into the third machine and it's going to be put out. So this is your input and basically all you're going to do the first machine's efficiency is 91.5 percent. The second one is 82 percent and the third one is 98.5 percent. And so all you have to do is multiply 0.915 times 0.82 times 0.985. And if you multiply that, you get 0 0.7390. And so we make it a percentage, so 73.9%. And we have three six bigs in all of our numbers, so we keep three six bigs for our answer. And that's the efficiency of the three together, 73, almost 74%. So whatever you started with, you're going to end up with 73.9 by the time it goes through all the machines. So that's all you have to do for those. They're not terribly difficult. Okay, so your homework tonight is 1 through 20, so make sure that y'all do those, and then the curveball questions, so we can go over your questions tomorrow.